In her vocal rendition of the great Thelonious Monk tune Rhythming, Karen McRae penned the lyric, Some cats swing and others don't. Don't you be the kind that won't. Today, we're going to talk about how to improve your swing feel while you're improvising. <laughs> All right, today's lesson is a bit of a trope, I would say, in the old social media age. It is a response to a couple comments that I got um, of a lesson that I posted a few weeks ago. That lesson was about kind of getting together some of the nitty gritty of our harmonic language as improvisers. And a few of the musicians just commented that, hey, Sean, well, all this stuff is great, but either me or my students really tend to struggle more with the rhythmic component of playing and the feel component of playing. How do I make my solos feel better and feel more authentic? And so I thought we would dig into that a little bit today. I thought those were really apt comments. And so I'd love to just share a few of my viewpoints on that and how I work on this with students. The first thing that we need to understand is that the way we play rhythm and our feel is really probably what defines us as musicians and what is ultimately going to get us gigs and performance opportunities. Yeah, it's important that you know we have all the harmonic stuff together and know all the tunes, all that kind of stuff. But if your feel is bad and your time is bad, nobody is going to wanna to play with you. And so this has gotta be one of the highest priorities for us to work on is to improve our time and to improve our feel. So let's talk about some avenues how we can do so. Now today we're really going to focus primarily on swing, but these things are really true through most styles of music. The first thing we want to get in touch with is what is swing? How do we have a good swing feel, um, even if I don't have my instrument? Uh, swing is made of a couple things. Number one, we've got to have a strong quarter note pulse. That is really what makes something swing and a band swing together, is that everybody is feeling the quarter note in the same place. Uh, the ride cymbal, that's mostly playing quarter notes. The upright bass, mostly playing quarter notes. If the drummer is feathering the kick drum, meaning they're playing quarter notes lightly on every beat, those are quarter notes. The guitar player, chunk, 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 quarter notes. So we wanna connect with that quarter note pulse. Um, for me, I think you have to feel this. You cannot think about where the rhythm is. Rhythm doesn't live here, rhythm lives in your body. Um, for me, that means tapping my heel. Uh, I tend to be somebody who taps my heel, but it can mean a lot of things. Um, it could just be a little bit of, you know, sort of motion in your ocean, um, whatever feels comfortable for you. But if you're somebody who doesn't feel comfortable moving to music, you need to simply get over that like yesterday. This is something that will improve your musicianship across every single style you play. If you can just get more comfortable with physically feeling where that beat is. So that is step number one, feel the quarter notes in our body. Step number two to making our swing feel a little bit better is to understand that swing is a subdivision of triplets in most cases. That's how we get the feel going on. Now we're not gonna think so much about like that I have a single quarter note and then a single eighth note all with a three under it. That sort of thing that you often see in the corner of like a big band chart or something like that. We are gonna think about feeling a constant triplet subdivision and just thinking about where the accents lie. So say this for me, do, do, la. Those three syllables, do, do, la. And we're gonna put that into triplets while feeling a quarter note pulse. Now, since I can't tap my foot here, I'm just gonna clap very lightly so you can see where my pulse is. I'm gonna go relatively slow. So my pulse is here. And I'm gonna think this do, do, la on top of that. Do, la, 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 do, la. Now, if that feels like a little bit of a tongue twister to you, you gotta practice that a little bit. Do, do, la. It's kind of like a doodle tongue um, for us as trombone players, but this really works across all instruments. All right, now that we have the fundamental of our quarter note pulse and our triplet subdivision, how do we make that really feel like swing? We're going to just put a subtle accent on the la, the third triplet, and we're gonna subtly de-emphasize the middle triplet. So that's gonna to start to sound like this. I'll start with it being even and then slowly add in this little bit of accent. Again, my quarter note pulse is here in my hands. Do la 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 do la. Now I have that going in my head at all times when I'm swinging. If it's fast, do la 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 do la. Especially if it's slow, do la do la do la do la. The slower it gets, I think the more challenging that becomes to keep that consistent. But these two things, a strong quarter note pulse and a triplet subdivision. Not that I'm playing triplets necessarily, I'm just subdividing triplets in my head to know where to place each one of those eighth notes. So now let's go to the horn. 
Once we've got our kind of solid foundation, we need to kind of connect with that there are some rhythms that are going to swing and some rhythms that are not going to swing so much. And there's by no means like a compendium of like swinging rhythms somewhere. This you all get from listening. Um, this is where that transcription and that listening really pays off. We'll talk about that in a moment. So let's just look at some examples of some rhythms that do swing, don't swing, and why they kind of work this way. So I'm gonna play a couple of these just on a single note on a concert B flat. One, two, three. Now, nothing wrong with that rhythm, half note, quarter note, but it's not the most swinging rhythm. We can change that just subtly and make it a little more swinging. One, two, three. A little more swinging. Let's look at a few other examples. I won't talk between each one of these. I will count it off though, just so we're on the same page of where the tempo is. One, two, three, four. Now the swinging version. One, two, three, four. Less swinging version, two, three. Now there I played swung eighth notes, but that's probably not the most swing feeling rhythm. Check this one out, two, three. That one started to feel a little more swinging. Now all these exist on a sort of spectrum and we could have things that really don't swing and then things that kind of swing and then things that really swing. Let's check out an example like that. One, two, three. A little more swinging this time, two, three. Then probably the most swinging in my opinion. One, two, three. Some overall concepts that we could take from that is generally speaking, when we had more off beats, things felt a little bit more swinging. More quarter notes, a little less swinging. Now that's certainly not a rule. You will find many places that depending on how you're articulated, depending on what the band is playing, quarter notes can actually be really swinging as long as they're articulated in the right way and they're really lining up with the band. Um, how do we actually practice on our horn is the question. Yeah, we've got these rhythms, but what do we do with them? Just take a simple scale. Um, let's take one of these rhythms and we're just gonna run it through, uh, let's do an E flat major scale. One, two, three. And so on and so forth up the scale. We could also do this maybe through a chord progression. Instead of a scale, maybe I start on the roots of each chord. So I'll play the first four bars of Autumn Leaves. That's a C minor seven to an F dominant seven to a B flat major seven to an E flat major seven. I use that same rhythm. When I play this rhythm through these changes, I'm going to have to accommodate that I'm on the and of four for the last beat. So I'm gonna have to anticipate the next chord um, as I get there. And I might have to change the rhythm just slightly to make it fit in. One, two, three. So I changed that rhythm slightly just to make it fit into uh, being one bar after another bar after another bar. Now what we're really doing when we do this sort of exercise is we are building our rhythmic vocabulary. Um, I'm a big believer in using vocabulary as a way to learn how to improvise. Some people might call this learning licks. Now this is by no means the end all be all of how we learn how to improvise, but it's a great way to get started, especially for younger and intermediate students who maybe haven't put in the transcription time yet and just haven't developed that repertoire of vocabulary. Uh, but this really, really works to help get that feeling going. Now, before we move on to talking about how listening and transcription plays a role in this, I do just want to point out that it's not just the rhythms that I played and the subdivision that I played, it's how I played them. It's the articulation that I use. We're not going to delve into all the different, you know, type of articulation things we want to think about. We'll do that in a future lesson, maybe. Um, but that example rhythm that I just played, dot, dot, do, dot, dot, the fact that I played it with those articulations is what makes it swinging. If I play it like this, not nearly as swinging, but if I really dig into it and think that my short notes are a dot, D-A-H-T, my long notes maybe get a little bit of accent and then everything else is maybe connected. This doesn't really have any connected notes in it. Um, that's what's gonna make it swing. So keep that in mind. It's not just what you play, but how you play it from an articulation standpoint that really will make things feel more appropriate. Now, as I mentioned earlier in this lesson, listening is where it's at with this. As everything is improvisation, listening has gotta be the foundation of how we improve on this stuff. But 
we can possibly transcribe in a little bit different way. You know, normally when we go through the transcription process, we really think about getting every single note, every single inflection, every single subtlety. What we can do if we wanna expand our rhythmic kind of vocabulary and language without necessarily having to transcribe every single thing uh, is we can just think about rhythms. Just think about transcribing rhythms and really trying to incorporate the rhythms that the great musicians play in our solos. So let's look at an example of this. The solo we're gonna check out here is just a few bars from the Lester Young solo on Lester's Bebop Boogie. I think this is a great solo for trombone players to work on. It's very playable on trombone and it is seriously swinging. It's a, a G blues, he, he uh, modulates a couple times in it. Um, so let's look at the example. One, two, three, four, one. Cool, so there's the line, just a nice little like tasty blues kind of thing. This happens uh, on the turnaround um, of the first chorus of the blues here. And you can see on the notes here, he's really not like playing any sort of like hip ideas, quote unquote. This might not be something that immediately, if you transcribe this, you might circle this and be like, oh man, I gotta learn that in all 12 keys. I think it's a great blues idea. Um, and oftentimes we overlook blues ideas when we're talking about things we wanna learn in all 12 keys, but this is definitely one to check out. But the rhythm here, I think, is just super, super swinging and is really applicable across uh, many different ideas. So the rhythm itself is just this. One, two, three, four, one. So let's look at just that much, the kind of first two measures of this idea. I could play that in a million different contexts and make it sound good. Works in blues ideas. It could work across a more change playing idea. Could work across a more melodic idea. Just so versatile because it is a great swing rhythm. Now, when I actually played the original of this and played the actual look that Lester played, you'll notice again, I didn't just think about only the notes um, or only the rhythm. I thought about notes, rhythm, feel, style, all those things. If I play that line without any of those extra elements and I just play the notes and the rhythm, it might sound like this. Now, certainly that doesn't sound bad, but if I add the same sort of style that Lester uses, there's a lot of articulation information in there. There's a few sort of notes he doesn't really articulate. Um, for example, in the, the second full bar on the D7 chord, he articulates the first two notes, but then kind of slides through the next two notes. and there's an accent on the high G. So all these things are really important as we develop our time and specifically our feel. If we just focus on right notes, right rhythms, even if we have a good quarter note pulse and a good triplet subdivision, it's still probably gonna fall a little bit flat when we think about, do I really sound like I have an authentic feel? As always, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you all in the woodshed.